materializing history, presenting the history of Polish Jews. My purpose this evening is really to talk about what uh, the importance of what I would call intangible heritage in a museum. We think of museums as places for original objects. Pauline Museum is a completely different kind of museum, and it's no less a museum for the intangibility of much of what it presents. But a brief introduction for those of you who have not visited the museum and may not be familiar with the project. I show you this image, which is where, the, where Europe's largest Jewish community once lived. This is the site of the Warsaw Ghetto. This is the site of the pre-war Jewish neighborhood. And this is what this area looked like after the Germans defeated the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in uh, 1943 and destroyed the, th this whole area. We are literally, literally, physically, symbolically creating this museum and telling the story of a thousand years of Polish Jewish life on the rubble. And this is our starting point, without an historic building and without a, an existing, a pre-existing collection. And, 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 what, and what we have is something very, very intangible. What we have is the story, and the story comes first. And so uh, what was this neighborhood? Uh, the image that you see on the left is a classic image. It's my personal favorite of all of Roman Vishniak's photographs. And it is a courtyard on Nalewski. And today, Nalewski is a nondescript, little street with a few uh, apartment buildings, communist era apartment buildings, and a pathetic plaque. Now what does the plaque on the right actually say? It's so, uh, it's on glass, it's almost indiscernible. It's not just the photograph, it's almost indiscernible. And what does this plaque say? This plaque says that there was once an Alevki street, this little street is called Alevki, it was in a different location, and it was named for a river that was the water supply for the city of Warsaw. No mention of what was on the left, that this was the center of the Jewish world. And so what, uh, what in fact, um, you know, what, what is left? So I wanna take you to an image of the great synagogue on Tlumatskia Street, and I want you to notice the building to its left. And to its left is the Judaic Library and the Institute for Jewish Studies that was part of the complex of the great synagogue of Tlum on Tlumatsky Street. And this great synagogue was uh, opened in 1878 and it was an expression of enormous pride and confidence of Warsaw's, I would say, integrationist Jewish community. A Jewish community, uh, that is to say, uh, a group of Jews who had the social and cultural capital to identify and feel themselves to be very Polish and at the same time very Jewish, and they created this incredible synagogue and this wonderful Judaic library. And it was with the, with the suppression of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the Germans, after they had suppressed the uprising, destroyed the Tlamatsky Synagogue. And the only thing left standing on the left was that library, was the, the Judaica Library and the Institute for Jewish Studies and it was obviously renovated, and it is today the home of the Jewish Historical Institute. And this is also the beginning of the story of the association of the Jewish Historical Institute of Poland. And I want to say a word about this institution, because it's, it's played such a critical role in the creating of Pauline Museum. Immediately after the war, um, I would say, well, before the war, there were 3,300,000 Jews living in Poland. 90% of them were murdered. And of those who survived, most of them survived in the Soviet Union. And they, uh, after the war, many of them came back to Poland. Others came out of hiding, and others returned from concentration camps. And there were about 240,000 Jews, more or less, uh, all of the Holocaust survivors in Poland right after the war. And one of the first things they did was to create something called the Central Jewish Committee, which attempted to reconstruct Jewish life. And there was within the Central Jewish Committee the, uh, the, the Jewish Historical Commission. And it's from that Jewish Historical Commission that there evolved the Jewish Historical Institute, which is housed in this building. Today it's called the Emanuel Ringelblum Jewish Historical Institute. And it is, if you will, a child of this NGO, the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute of Poland. And that NGO was formally established as such 
1951. And it is um, a, a, a Jewish nonprofit established in Poland. It is the oldest and it is the biggest and most important Jewish philanthropic uh, institution in post-war Poland. And it has two children. One of its children, if you will, is the Jewish Historical Institute and the other is Pauline Museum. And it is thanks to the efforts of the Jewish Historical Institute that the whole idea for the museum arose. And so to give you a sense of where we're located, we're located on the rubble that I showed you at the outset, and we're also located facing the monument to the ghetto heroes, the monument to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of 1943. And the image that I'm showing you here shows you in the background the destroyed city of Warsaw because a year after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, there was the Warsaw Uprising, and as a result of that failed uprising, uh, the Germans destroyed 80% of the city of Warsaw, and you can see the destroyed city in the background. But in 1948, on the fifth anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, there was the unveiling of the Rappaport, the, the monument by Natan Rappaport, and you can see it being unveiled on the rubble of the ghetto. It's an extraordinary, uh, it's an extraordinary moment, and we actually present this unveiling through newsreel footage that was shot at the time, and it's actually part of the exhibition because we are a site-specific museum and we are on a site of conscience. So a, a quick word about the forming of the museum, and then I want to turn to the real heart of the idea of, if you will, that the most important asset of the museum is fundamentally intangible. So the, the idea for the museum arose um, in 1993 with the opening of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. And Virginia Pavlak, who was then at that time associated with the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute of Poland, she, she really had the idea that if there was a Holocaust Museum in Washington, there should be a museum of the history of Polish Jews in Poland. And th when I think about it, I think to myself, the last thing Poland needs is a Holocaust Museum in the sense that the whole country is already a Holocaust Museum, but this is where the Germans built all the death camps and there isn't, there's hardly a place in Poland where there is not some sign or some sense of, of the Holocaust. And so it took a couple of years for this idea to coalesce as a project and for the association to take it on as a project. And um, you know, I think the, the film we saw today and the approach of Rick and Laura to, to, to the Gwoździec project, but to many other projects, but especially to Gwoździec, really exemplifies Pauline Museum, which is to say that it is the result of people who were first and foremost idealistic, but not very realistic, which is probably the only way that such an incredible project could happen. And I would say that it was when our, the chairman of the management board of the association, Piotr Wyszlitski, when he took charge of completing the project, that realism set in. And it was really thanks to his brilliant um, ability to organize and to lead the project to completion that we have the museum that we have today. And I would say that the person who was responsible for really getting the project off the ground and for leading it for the first 15 years was a man by the name of Jeja Halberstadt. And so it, took, it takes people with particular gifts to get a project started and also to actually complete it. Between 2000 and 2004, we developed the master plan for the exhibition, but there was still no museum. It wasn't until 2005 that the museum was actually founded and the architectural competition for the building was conducted. And the founding of the museum was, as Shana indicated, a unique public-private partnership for a cultural institution in Poland. It was the association, the logo was at the very bottom of the list, joining together with the city of Warsaw and the Ministry of Culture and National Heritage. We opened the building in 2013. We had the grand opening with the opening of the core exhibition in 2014. And by the end of 2015, we'd had about a million visitors. And that's really extraordinary. Warsaw is a city of about 2 million people. Poland is a country of about 40 million people. This is not New York City. This is not Germany. This is really, I think, uh, very, very exceptional. And we can talk later about why and how and who's coming. And so the, the critical defining uh, feature of the, of the place, of the location of the museum, is the monument to the ghetto heroes. 
and the building itself was, uh, is, is, is the result of this competition. The winner is a Finnish architect, Rainer Mahlamaki, and he has created, as Laurie indicated earlier, a building that's very minimalist and geometric on the outside and very dramatic and very organic on the inside. And I'll say more about that uh, tomorrow. But I, I want to come back to um, Naomi Seidman's personal comment at the very, very beginning of our, of our program uh, here today at the Magnus. And I want to just uh, to be very precise because I was very deeply moved by her father's diary. And it is, as she indicated, the inspiration for our mezuzah, which I will also show you. So after the great deportation of 300,000 Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto in the summer of 1942, Hillel Zeidman was responsible for gathering up the books from houses now completely empty. Wandering the silent streets with a wheelbarrow, he recalled a friend, Benjamin Wolf Henelis, who had written to him from America just before the war. And this is a quotation from Zeidman's diary that's dated January 15, 1943. And this is uh, just a couple of months after the Great Deportation. Quote, there are moments, especially on Sabbaths and holidays, that I wish I could kiss the cobblestones on the Lefke. And you saw that courtyard on the Lefke, you have a sense of it. Zeidman continues, and I recalled what Albert Londres, author of the book The Wandering Jew, once wrote me. When Elijah the prophet will have to announce the coming of the Messiah, where will he place himself to blow blast from his shofar, his ram's horn? And Londres answered, precisely here on the corner of Gensha and Alevki, because this is where the world's largest concentration of Jews and Yiddishkeit are to be found. Here and nowhere else is the very center of the Jewish world. And so when it came time to make uh, a mezuzah, we had a mezuzah contest in November of 2000. 13, um, and, um, and I, I was on the jury. And of course, the, all the proceedings were in Polish, so I needed to be coached a little bit. But um, in any event, the winner, the winner is the mezuzah that you see on the right. And, the, and what we did was, in fact, to locate the corner of Gensha and the Lefki, which is today in a park near the museum, to go there with earth-moving equipment and with the rabbi of Poland, because whenever you move earth in this area, you have to check that there are no human remains, because you mustn't disturb them. And this bulldozer excavated down to the foundation of a pre-war tenement and extracted this brick, which was then cut in half, hollowed out, and then the, uh, the parchment was put inside, and the chief rabbi of Poland, Rabbi Shudrick, uh, Rabbi Michael Shudrick, he installed it, on the day in that we opened the building to the Jewish community. Uh, and that preceded the formal opening of the building in 2013. Now, uh, as I've said, the greatest asset of this museum is intangible, which is to say its story. And beyond its story, I would say the thoughts, experiences, feelings, ideas, uh, much that is of critical importance to understanding the history of Polish Jews, but doesn't express itself in the way in which we expect museums to do so through collections of objects. But objects, of course, are very important. And the most um, single most important collection of objects relating to Polish Jews in Poland is at the Jewish Historical Institute. That collection is largely 19th and 20th century. Uh, there's a strong focus on objects associated with the Holocaust period and the post-war years. And of course, Judaica, which is the mainstay of collections in Jewish museums and paintings. And we have a thousand year story to tell. In addition, there's a very, very important collection, and this will give you a sense of the challenge, which is to say that we started without a collection, we formed a collection specifically for our core exhibition, but you can imagine how you form a collection for this thousand year story on the one hand, and in terms of there even being any objects, objects even being available, and most of the kinds of objects that we would be interested in showing are in existing collections. So I want to give you an example of the challenge. And that is the National Museum in Krakow has a very, very important collection of Polish Judaica. And this is how it's displayed. It's in a corridor. A big, huge sign says Judaica, which all, right away tells you that it's only religious material, that it, it, there's no ethnographic material, there's actually no fine art in this. It's all liturgical material. 
and you have the entrance to this corridor. It's a dark corridor. It has these showcases. Now, there is one object here that I would kill for, and it is, right, I don't, it probably just doesn't, is not going to show it, but it's, um, it's in the middle of, on the left slide at the right, and you can see it enlarged on the very right, and it's in the dark in the back of a showcase. This is the most incredible object. I would give anything to have it. However, and, and, and this, is, this is it, you can really see it. It's fabulous. It's an 18th century alms box that the Hebrew Kaddisha, that the burial society used because it's a, a, a tradition, uh, it's a Jewish tradition that when somebody dies in connection with the funeral that you would put coins in the box. And this box, um, which was made in Krakow, given as a gift to the Hebrew Kaddisha, has on its sides, it has I think six sides and the, and the lid, it has on its sides each of the stages that the Hever Kadisha goes through to prepare a body for burial. So it illustrates the entire process. You know, from our perspective, it is just a fabulous, fabulous thing. However, like, essentially, since nobody can see it at the end of a dark corridor on the back shelf of a poorly lit showcase, why couldn't, why wouldn't they loan it to us? The answer is no, they wouldn't loan it. So we wanted it, so we made a facsimile. We made, we made a facsimile. So what were the rules for making the facsimile? Couldn't be the same size. It had to be a little bit bigger. And there's a marvelous inscription near where the handle is, which actually gives you the information as to who gave it in what year, etc. It was given by a group of young men. We had to somehow not put that inscription because God forbid somebody should think it's the real object. There's so many ways we could have made it clear it's not the real object. So. For, uh, well, first of all, to have anything from the 18th century, any, any kind of material, Polish Jewish 18th century is really, uh, they're very rare, very, very rare to have material like this. It's different for Italy, it's different for, for other places, but for Poland, it's really rare. So what did we do instead? So first of all, we made, we made the replica, and we decided, since you can hardly see what's on the sides of the box anyway, we'll make a huge one. So we have the, the, the little object, we have it in the center, and then we, we actually enlarge the whole box so that you'd be able to really see all the stages. And then what we did was to take an ethical will, which actually is a beautiful example of what I would call intangible heritage. So what's an ethical will? An ethical will is um, a genre of writing where, in, especially when a man would go on a, on a voyage, on a trip, and he would write a kind of a, a will of ethics, to his, usually to his family, to his wife, to his children, so that he bequeathed to them ethical, ethics. As a po I mean, obviously he must have had a normal will also, but an ethical will is a particular genre. And we have a marvelous, there's a marvelous ethical will from the 18th century in which this particular man describes how he wants to be treated when he is sick, when he is dying, when he is dead, when he is buried, and, and when they are mourning for him. And for example, he doesn't want anybody who said anything bad about him to come to his funeral. I mean, <laughs> for example, for example. So what we did was to use this uh, six-sided uh, box, create this very large box, and then on the surfaces around the glass part of the top to provide excerpts from the ethical will that match the stages at which uh, the stages that the Hebrew Kaddisha, that the burial society went through. So in terms of communicating, yes, the touchstone is the copy of the original object, but it's the intangible heritage, if you will, of the significance of the object and of the, if you will, the meaning attributed to what it is the burial society does that really matters. Now, um, that we did, when, when uh, the, the foundations were dug for the building, there were objects in the ground. And this is one of them. I think it's one of the most touching objects we have in our collection, which is a spoon around which a tree, tree's root had actually um, grown. And I have no idea whether this object is from before the war, whether it's during the war, or whether in the 70 years since the war, this, uh, uh, the, the, this root grew around it. But, it, um, but, but in this case, this particular object, although the, the assumption is that it's from the Holocaust period, we really don't know. 
And we have not used it in the exhibition, and I've been thinking to myself, had we wanted to, how would we do so? And that's, that's another whole question. But it is an example, if you will, of a very, an object very specific to our site and to our story and to our collection. So let me turn now to the nature of the exhibition and the challenges of, if you will, uh, working with the intangible within an institution and within a medium that is an art of the concrete, is how I would put it. So during the period between 1996, when the project was declared, and 2005, when the museum itself was actually established, the team, under the direction of Yezha Halberstadt, created the outline of the historical program, a database of materials that could be useful. It's now maybe 60, 70,000 items, photographs, objects, letters, diaries, all kinds of materials, and a master plan. And the master plan set out a basic structure and approach. In fact, in the film that you saw today, some of the images that were shown are actually from the master plan, and the exhibition itself doesn't look anything like those images, although the master plan provided a very solid foundation for the creating of the exhibition. So, but I, li I like to say that although our exhibition is not uh, object-driven, although it's not collection-driven, um, it, 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 it's, uh, it's something else. It's still, uh, you know, I've had, I've had colleagues say to me, you know, you're really lucky you didn't have a building. You're really lucky you didn't have a collection. Is if you had a building, you'd have to fit your exhibition into that synagogue or that historic building, which was never intended for a museum and is not very well suited to a museum. I mean, I'm thinking of the house that the Magnus Museum was originally cited in, would be an example. And if you have a collection, then you're obliged to show it. Now, of course, I would like to have that kind of problem, but nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless. So our approach uh, was to start with our greatest asset, which is the story and to create what I like to call a theater of history. And to create, um, if you will, an experience that was narrative, that worked with objects, which are very, very important, and as we acquire more that are relevant to the story, we'll absolutely include them. But the story is first, and we were in a position to use every method, means, material to communicate that story and I think of museums generally, even object-based object museums, as a form of theater. Still life theater, environmental theater, scenographic theater, but I think, I, think of, I think of museums and exhibitions as theater, and in our case, it's a theater of history. And this is a very beautiful example of it, I'll come to it in just a moment, but it's the, uh, this is really the moment when, in 1772, between 1772 and 1795, when the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth is partitioned and the long 19th century begins. And this is how we literally stage history. Now, our starting point for the exhibition is something very intangible. It is a legend. And it is the legend that is the source of the name of the museum, Pauline Museum. And uh, I think in the film today, uh, Anthony Polonsky explained the meaning of Polonia, which is another uh, another name. And we take, this This is a legend, and we take the version as retold by Agnon, the <coughs> Nobel laureate in Hebrew literature, and the story goes something like this, that Jews are being persecuted in Western Europe, and they fled eastward, they found themselves in a forest, and then they heard the word Pauline, whether it was the birds chirping, or in clouds broke, and an angel's hand pointed, and they thought they heard Hebrew, they thought they heard Pauline, here dwell, here rest, here you shall rest. And they said to themselves, and here we shall stay until we are taken to the land of Israel, in other words, until the Messiah comes, which is a very long time. And so this is the, this is the story, this is, uh, what we wanted to do was to, in a sense, create a priming experience for our visitors so that they would, in a sense, leave behind their everyday world and prepare themselves to enter into this theater of history. And we wanted to do it by starting with a very poetic forest with a space of historical imagination, a space where we could, in a sense, hear how Jews 
told themselves or tried to imagine for themselves how they came to Poland and why they stayed. It's a very counterintuitive way of beginning this story. That, and, and I think it's critical for understanding why the most important period of the story is the 1,000 years and why we tell the story in the way that we did, considering the incredibly uh, important catastrophic place of the Holocaust in this story, which I'll say more about in just a moment. So let, let me start with the first um, almost 600 years. Let's start with the first historical gallery. We, we, uh, we come down a grand staircase, we enter the forest, we, um, we, we encounter the story, the legend of Pauline, and then we cross a threshold between legend and history as we enter the medieval gallery. The medieval gallery covers the period 965 to 1507. That's more than half of the 1,000 years. It's more than half of the millennium. What precisely exists in the world, not that we can find, we can get, but what in the world exists that was made in Poland, made by Jews, or relates directly to Jewish life? What exists? Exactly two kinds of objects, tombstones and coins. Now this coin here looks very exhibitable, except it's the size of a penny. Here it looks like the, the wheel on a, on a, a truck, but it's not, it's, it's this big. Now these coins are wonderful. They're, uh, they have Hebrew inscriptions on them. They're a sign that Jews were involved as administrators of the royal mint. And the tombstone, this is the earliest tombstone that we have from Poland. It's actually from the Wrocław Cemetery at the time in the 13th century, Wrocław was part of Poland, and it's dated 1203. And it's very interesting because it's a tombstone for uh, I think it's called David, son of Sar Shalom, which suggests that he was actually a Sephardic Jew, had a beautiful voice, which suggests that he was a cantor. And so it's, it's a great tombstone, and there are several others. But you cannot make an almost 600-year story out of coins and tombstones. And so we really had to find another way of working. So I want to show you um, how we essentially took inspiration from what I would call the immaterial and intangible assets that we had at our disposal. And so the first thing that we did was to go to our sources. And where, where, what kind of sources tell you something about Jews in this very early period in the Wild East? What kind of sources do you have? You have especially important are the, the letters that rabbis wrote, uh, wrote to the, each other, and especially the letters that were sent about what was going on in the Wild East that were sent to the rabbis in the Rhineland, which in the medieval period was the center of Ashkenazi Jewish life. And so the first thing we did is we went to that correspondence, we went to travel accounts, to chronicles, to legal documents, and we extracted stories from that material that we thought could really communicate this, uh, help us to communicate this history over this almost 600 year period. That was the first thing. The second is we took illuminated manuscripts, Ashkenazi illuminated manuscripts from this period, largely from the Rhineland. And the, uh, and the third thing we did is we went to two of Poland's most famous comic book artists. This is Jezieze, this is George the Hedgehog, and this says Nie dla dzieci, not for children. Well, uh, actually they, they make a very, very popular comic book for kids, but they also do adult comics. Um, and they're wonderful comic book artists. And we said to them, take our stories, take these medieval illuminations. We gave them also illuminations from, from Christian manuscripts and from Hebrew manuscripts. And we said to them, illustrate our stories. And then we hired uh, three conservatories that specialize in the conservation of Polish churches medieval, renaissance, um, po wonderful Polish churches, and that restore the painted interiors. And we said to them, paint the walls. And so here we, this guy, I don't know why he's wearing uh, camouflage, uh, but in any event, that was how he worked. And in his case, he actually projected the drawings on the wall and then traced them and then painted them. Um, and this is the, the kind of result that we got. Now, uh, there are a couple of things I want to say about this, because I, th I think it really goes to the heart of our story. So first of all, as a result of this approach, we created a 100% literally hand-painted, hand-gilded gallery. And you don't expect that in a multimedia narrative exhibition. You expect everything high-tech, projections, films. We have that too. 
But this is a handmade gallery. That's the first thing. The second is that, and you can uh, not see it uh, as well as I would like, but we have quotations from those primary sources and they are illustrated. And so within about two meters of coming into the medieval gallery, you encounter three extremely interesting stories that are from the rabbinical response of literature, from these, the, the uh, letters that rabbis were sending. Because the rabbis in the Rhineland were worried that these traveling Jewish merchants that were wandering around the, the Wild East, that maybe they weren't being observant. So you have, for example, on, on the right, you've got two gentlemen with swords. It turns out that on the Sabbath you can carry weapons, but the question was whether you can unsheath the sword on the Sabbath. Or in the middle, you have two people repairing a wheel. And this is a story about Jews who were on the road. It was Friday, the wheel on their wagon broke, and they had a dilemma. Should they stay 24 hours and wait until the Sabbath was over and repair the wheel, or should they repair the wheel, go on to the town, arrive after the Sabbath starts, and, ha and violate the Sabbath? So I don't know, what do you think they did? What do they do? They repaired the wheel, and they got to the town, and the Jews in the town were furious, wouldn't let them into the synagogue, and it's a whole story. And then on the, le on the far left is another very interesting story. So in other words, some traveling Jewish merchant was going by, and, uh, or sometimes it would even be uh, somebody with more religious training, and the people, uh, the Jews living there said, listen, we've got a problem. We, we have a mikveh, but normally it's from a cold spring, and our spring is hot, got hot water. Is that okay? So these are the kinds of cases that turn up. And what we did was to present those stories in the original Hebrew with Polish and English translation, with these illustrations that were made by our comic book artists based on medieval illuminations and painted by our church conservators. And so, and, and the style of the um, illustrations changed because it's a 600 year, almost 600 year period. They changed so that the ones from the earlier period are consistent with illumination from the earlier period. And then this is our hand-painted gallery and also hand-gilded using real gold and traditional gilding techniques. And so, in a sense, whatever we may lack in original objects, we, I think, make up for. We can never make up for not having wonderful original objects, but to some degree, it's a very material exhibition that real materials, real gold, real pigments, um, and, and, and I think that, that the sense of materiality of the exhibition is extremely important. So this gives you a little bit of a se sense of, of how we dealt with this uh, first period. This is a first period which is essentially the story of how from a very few Jewish traveling merchants, by the end of the period, this territory is becoming a center of the Ashkenazi Jewish world, by 1507, there's an estimated 15,000 Jews living here, whereas in the 10th century, uh, we, you know, we, you, you, I would say 11th, 12th century, you have traveling merchants, and very, very slowly, slowly, slowly uh, does this evolve. When we cross the threshold between the medieval period and the early modern period, the period of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, essentially this territory has become the largest, uh, one of the largest countries in Europe, certainly one of the most diverse, and it's a result of Poland having absorbed Ukraine in the medieval period and then forming a union um, of the, the Commonwealth with Lithuania between 1569 and 1772. And when I say it, that it be, this is actually the period where this territory becomes the a center, if not the center of the Jewish world, and certainly of the Ashkenazi Jewish world. And so if we had about 15,000 Jews at the end of the medieval period, in this period, by 1765, there are 750,000 Jews living in this area, and it's mainly through natural increase. So, what do we want to communicate about this period, uh, and especially the first half of the period? One of the things we want to communicate is what made, what made this territory, and what made this period, in quotation marks, if you will, golden, for Polish Jews, because it's often considered in Polish history as a golden age, because it's a large and prosperous uh, country, and, but from a Jewish perspective, what made it golden is something else. And so one of the things that we do is to work with the, these uh, texts that are for us the primary sources and to create um, a narrative that is multi-voiced. And this is our wall of words, and it's our opening to this 
early modern gallery to this gallery that really goes from 1569 to 1648. And we take uh, the word paradisus iureorum and we take it from a satirical poem that was created, um, well, it was, it was written on the occasion of a coronation and it was critical of everything in the Commonwealth. Nothing was right with the Commonwealth. And so in this poem, it says that the uh, Polish kingdom is paradise for the Jews, hell for the peasants, um, purgatory for the burghers, and rule by servants. And then it says in another version, paradise for the Jews, shelter for heretics, um, uh, it's a harvest for foreigners, and fatherland of Im for immigrants. It sounds like Europe today. And so the, these uh, paradise for the Jews meant that Jews had it too good, it was critical. And so the question we put to our visitors is, well, was it a paradise for Jews? In what ways, yes. In what ways, no. And we put it in a relation with quotations from Rabbi Moses Isserlis, who had, I would say, from our point of view, rather low expectations. He says, the hatred of us in this country is, um, is not as bad as in the German lands. May it remain so until the coming of our Messiah. Well, it means it was considerably better, and indeed it was. And we have from nobility and from Karaites. So what we've done here is there is no object that can communicate this in the way that we feel in this multi-voiced fashion we would like to communicate it. And what we're communicating here is something very intangible. And so moving uh, uh, to the two things that made this period golden from the point of view of Polish Jews were number one, the rise of rabbinical authority. Whereas in the medieval period, the Rhineland had been the center of rabbinical authority. In this period, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth is the center. And it's marked by the rise of great rabbis, yeshivas, scholarship, and Hebrew and Yiddish printing. And Hebrew and Yiddish printing was a, a way for us to materialize what is actually quite immaterial, which is thought, scholarship, ideas. And so we created printing presses, initially for kids, but it turns out, of course, that adults love it. And we also, at the Stenders in our library, were able to open up books, which we, we have original books, and we show original books from the period that were actually printed in Poland, in Hebrew and in Yiddish. But we, uh, in order for a visitor to do more than gaze at them and be impressed by the aura of the original book, we wanted to open them up. And we did that by using digital interactive technologies, and in this case, a fabulous, um, a Kabbalistic scroll that was created in Modena in the 16th century by, uh, by David Darshan, who as part of his, if you will, spiritual development, actually copied a scroll, which was a, a convention at the time. Now, let me take you to the corner of Broadway and Bleecker in Manhattan. This is, um, uh, this is two, the year is 2007. Uh, the cafe is Angelica, and uh, I was on a very short visit to New York from Warsaw, and Michael Berkovich, uh, who is a, a synagogue designer, designs interiors and Holocaust memorials, uh, he called me and he said, I have two friends that are here, two colleagues that are here from Massachusetts, Rick and Laura Brown, and I want you to meet them. And I said, I don't have time, my plane is leaving, I have to go back to Warsaw. He said, I want you to meet them. I said, okay. So we met at the Angelica Cafe, and they had with them uh, a laptop, and they showed me a five-minute film of the making of the Bima. It, 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 in other words, it was a one-week project, which is pretty amazing anyway, but they had made a, a, a five-minute film. And, uh, and we, we talked, we chatted. I saw the film, and I said, that's it. I get it. I get it. And uh, the original uh, master plan, when the master plan had uh, put forward that synagogue uh, project, actually it was very strange because there are two different images that show how Event Communications, which is the London design firm that had developed our master plan, they showed on the one hand, and you saw it in the film, the wooden roof, but they also show an interior shot and the ceiling underneath it was wood, it wasn't painted. And I don't, even, I don't even know which synagogue it's from, but it was wood, it wasn't painted. And it just sort of, it hung, 
And the idea was that they, you would stand under it and you'd look out and you would see market scenes and scenes from around the town and they used you know, interwar year black and white photographs. So clearly it was not at all the way in which we wanted to work and it wasn't at all clear. You know, and, and, and the budget for this element was a budget to go to a theater prop maker and have somebody just make something make whatever, and actually at the point that the building was designed, there was no plan to create an opening in the floor to, for this. We were lucky enough to um, uh, have decided to make this structure at a moment where it was still possible to create this opening. So, but in any event, it was clear to me that this was the most brilliant approach to uh, if you will, uh, creating a new kind of object. Uh, that's what I call it. I say the issue is not whether it's real or not real. The issue is not whether it's an original or a copy. This is an actual object, but of a new kind and of a different kind. And what defines it is the process by which it was made. It was the approach to the making of it that defines it. So, it, th at this, so I came back to Warsaw and I said, okay, this is what we have to do for our synagogue. And, and the answer was, why would you do it that way? And what will it cost? And it's too complicated and we can't do it. And the turning point, uh, I would say, was, um, I, don't know, I don't know why Yezha Halberstadt agreed, but I think probably because otherwise it wouldn't stop insisting and, and, and you know, complaining. And uh, so he said, okay. He said, our project manager, Robert Supel, he said, it's okay for him to take his car, and me, and Rick, and Laura, and to drive around Poland. Essentially, Jeja thought we would prove that the project couldn't be done. So we were to drive around Poland, and we were to visit different synagogues, and visit different towns, to determine whether or not they would be willing to receive us to do this project. And he was convinced that it wouldn't work. So we did. And, um, and Robert, uh, who I think was neutral, by the end of the trip, he was completely sold on the project. And as you can see from the film, Rick and Laura are completely charismatic, and it's impossible n not to be completely sold on, um, on, on, their, on their idea, which is a brilliant idea anyway. So now I had an ally. And together, uh, and at this time, actually, uh, Supel was uh, taking a course in cultural management, and he had to do a project. He decided to make a business plan for the Gwoździec project. So between the two of us, we managed to go, 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 until we found a donor, Irene Pletka, who, when she saw this project, she said instantly, instantly, I'll support it. And once we had her support, and we had Robert's business plan, and, um, and somehow or other we prevailed. And that was 2007. And it wasn't until 2011 they were actually able to, to put the project into effect. It really, it took us uh, from 2007 to 11, so that's four years, even more than four years, to, to, really, to really make it happen. And so, um, of course, this is the project, and I wanted to say a couple of things about it that weren't apparent from the film, but that also are in response to some of the questions that came up afterwards. So as you know, for those of you who didn't see the film this morning, we did the timber framing in Sanok in an open air folk architecture museum. We worked from documentation. In fact, the earliest documentation is from 1890, from Karl Machkowski, who uh, as his doctoral dissertation, he was an ar artist, but also an architectural historian. He began uh, making his documentation in, in uh, 1890, and he continued along through the first half of the 1890s. Uh, Car uh, uh, Breyer, uh, Alois Breyer, a Viennese art architectural historian who made, uh, as we showed in the film, hundreds of architectural drawings, uh, cutaways, uh, cross sections, uh, floor plans, color studies. And then, of course, the reassembly and hoisting of the, of the uh, structure, it's 25 tons and suspended from those cables that you can see. Um, and the painting of the elements in all these different towns, uh, on the left with Rabbi Shudrick, um, and uh, all these different painting workshops um, in Wrocław at the White Stork Synagogue. And then what went on? Now, I had, a, I had a dream. I know, that sounds familiar. I had a dream. My dream was that during the grand opening in 2014, 
that my favorite cantor, Rabbi Yaakov Lemmer, would perform from the bima, and he did, and he did, um, and he did in the presence uh, the presence of the president of Israel and the president of Poland together, and it was absolutely extraordinary, and uh, it was made possible by the association because we had to find. Uh, in fact, the, the, the funds to pay him and to, to arrange for him to be there. And um, I, of course, was not important enough to be present. Uh, however, he needed to rehearse. So I was there for the rehearsal. And you can see the guard, you know, and the guards all gathered round. They couldn't believe what was happening. And it was the most extraordinary, extraordinary moment to have Rabbi Lemmer, uh, uh, Cantor Lemmer perform from the Bema. And then, if you, um, I think Rick mentioned earlier, uh, the kids. So the kids, uh, they have these cushions, they're like, and they have straps, so they can wear them as a backpack, or they can take them off, put them on the floor, and sit. Or, in this case, they just spread out all over the floor and lay there and contemplated the ceiling. And then we have all kinds of projects that we do with them. Uh, but also, also, we have on these stenders, we have two interactive stations. One is dedicated to the ceiling, which is interpreted uh, using two sacred texts. One, Sefer Yitzirah, which is a very early, very important Kabbalistic mystical text, and the other is the song of praise of God's creation, which really, we think, at least according to one theory, inspired the bestiary that is uh, around the lower level of the ceiling. On the upper level, where you have the, uh, the roof visible, we've created um, a, a presentation of the making of the synagogue and also the documentation. And even kids, I mean, I, this, these kids were not posing. These are photographs that I took. And I just thought that uh, to have kids this age to be so intrigued by, by what looks like an unfinished barn, because there's nothing spectacular about it uh, in, in, you know, when you see it in this form. I mean, really, the, the painted ceiling, I think, is where the action is. So let me turn now to another example, and this time from the 19th century. Uh, in the, 19th, the long 19th century, we call encounters with modernity, and our goal in the long 19th century was to really explore the challenges that Jews faced after the Commonwealth was divided up between Austria, um, Prussia, um, and Russia. And Jews now found themselves, everybody found themselves, living under these new new situation with new rules, new regulations, some li old ones lifted, other ones imposed. So we call it encounters with modernity. And among the encounters with modernity are, of course, the Jewish Enlightenment, but there are also encounters that uh, Marcin Wojcinski, who was a lead historian for this project, calls defensive modernization. That is to say, those who defend tradition, but in defending tradition, actually create something new. In other words, it's modernization that is created in defense of tradition. I know it sounds like a paradox, but Hasidism is an example, and the modern yeshiva. So when the historians for the 19th century said that we had to present the modern yeshiva, I said to myself, you know, how are we going to interest the 15-year-old Polish boy? That's our hardship case. The fi how are we going to get him interested in the modern yeshiva, meaning you know, from 1803, the yeshiva of Volozhin, the yeshiva of Mir, the Telts yeshiva. And I said, okay, you insist, fine. I said, give me the material. They said, well, there are no photographs, there are no paintings, there are no objects, there are no drawings. Yes, so what do we have? What we had, and, and what we had was incredible, completely intangible. What we had were memoirs, diaries, we had accounts by the students who were in these yeshivas and people who visited them, who were so amazed by what they saw and they described what they saw so vividly because these were yeshivas where the study of Torah for its own sake, not as preparation to be a rabbi, was a principle. And the idea was that if you study Torah or if in the yeshiva, the study of Torah went 24 hours, that somehow the redemption would be brought more quickly. And so the methods of study were, were, were new, the role of the head of the yeshiva, they were private institutions, they were incredibly important. So what we did was we took those diaries and we took those accounts and we created um, a script from that original material and we created a, an animation, a film, 
of 24 hours and the yeshiva of Volozhin in four minutes and 45 seconds. And it goes something like this. So just a second, uh, yeah. Okay, just a moment. Okay, so we did two things. One is that in the studio, uh, on the computer, we created the sonography. And the only, only image we had was the exterior of the building of the uh, Yeshiva of Volozhin, which was very impressive. If you have 250 young men studying all at the same time in a big hall, that was definitely something new. And then we cast live actors, including, including the son of Albert Stankowski, who had just had his bar mitzvah. This is a kid, a Jewish kid, that was born and raised in Poland, just had his bar mitzvah, and he is one of the yeshiva boys um, in, our, in our yeshiva film. And we painted the actors. And we shot the actors in a green room, against a green screen, because when you do that, you can then take the film and you can put it together with this, uh, with this sonography. Whoops. And then what we did was we, uh, we, we uh, made the film, we put the pieces together, and then we projected the film on canvas and we refilmed it so you could see the canvas, the weave of the canvas in the film. In other words, the idea was that it was like a 19th century painting that had come to life. And it turned out that with no material, no objects, and no visual material, that somehow or other we were able to create one of the most memorable, one of the most moving experiences in the entire exhibition. And to, to communicate it in a very economical way, because you have to be extremely economical in an exhibition. So 24 hours in the yeshiva of Volozhin in 4 minutes 45 seconds. The Tlamatsky Synagogue makes its appearance. So you saw the Tlamatsky Synagogue opened in 1878. It was an enormous, enormous pride. It was one of the biggest synagogues in all of Europe. It was designed by one of Poland's most favorite Italian architects. He designed many buildings, destroyed uh, by the Germans in 1943. And we created an exquisite scale model. And I think there's a beautiful statement in the Hans House film that we saw today that scale models are a way of thinking. They aren't just a substitute for something bigger. That is, that the scale model, scale models are as good today as the day they were born. It's a very old exhibition technique, and they're very, very communicative. You can see spatial relationships, and you can see a whole building. You can often not see a whole building when the building is for real and huge. You can't see this whole building. If, I, if we had a scale model of it, you could. But you can't, if you go outside now, you can't see the whole building. There's no way, not even, from, not even from an airplane. So scale models have enormous value, and we use this as a centerpiece for a story of Jews who consider themselves poles of the Mosaic faith. They were integrationists. So our, 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 we have our Gvoshet synagogue, and we have this. Now, I should say that there's something very intangible that, is, that was created for the Gvoshet installation and also for here. And that is a soundscape, in the case of Grozhets, of Ashkenazi liturgy. It was created by Judith Frigesi, who is an historian of Ashkenazi liturgy. And it's intended to create a sense of the sound of prayer of the kind that you would have heard in such a prayer space. And in this case, we have the earliest sound recording made by a cantor. And it's Gershon Sirota, and it's from the first years of the 20th century, and he was a cantor for this synagogue, for the Tlamatsky synagogue. So sound, which is very intangible, we treat as an artifact, and we've also incorporated it into the exhibition itself. And coming now to the final, the, the, of course, the Holocaust Gallery is a story unto itself, and I'll talk about that more in the lecture tomorrow night. But I want to I wanna move now to the, to the final gallery, to the post-war years gallery. So there were many, of course, who said that our exhibition should end with the Holocaust, that there was no story after the Holocaust. And in fact, most, uh, I would say, the, the Museum of Jewish Heritage in Lower Manhattan, when you exit the floor dealing with the Holocaust and you come to the upper floor with the period after the war and the renewal of Jewish life, there's a focus on America and in Israel, nothing about Europe. Europe is a closed book, it's over. And from our point of view, particularly in Poland, that post-war years period is a period that Jews around the world know nothing about, uh, unless, of course, they're from Poland, and that people living in Poland who didn't experience this themselves are actually not very well informed about either, and we consider it an incredibly important period. 
Now talk about intangible. I mean, on the one hand, what's tangible is the 240,000 Jews who survived and found themselves in Poland. But their stories are very intangible. And what we did was we took the registration forms that they filled out. The Central Jewish Committee immediately tried to find a way for Jews to register themselves and to be able to find each other. And we wanted to communicate how few had survived. And so we, in a sense, materialized the absence of those Jews who could not fill out these forms. And we made tiles that were the shape and had impressed on them those forms. And those are blank. And then, in the, the places where you can see an image, we created an interactive that would present the filled out registration forms and the <coughs> stories of those who survived. In the Soviet Union, that was one. The second one, those who came out of concentration camps. The third, those who came out of hiding. And the fourth is blank, those Jews who survived but did not want to register and did not want to, uh, in a sense, identify themselves as, as Jewish. The Warsaw Ghetto, the monument to the ghetto heroes, which defines the site on which we are, on which the museum stands, is itself very tangible. But the, what's intangible, in a sense, is the unveiling of the monument and the ceremony around it. In other words, performance. But it's captured in a medium, in this case, a newsreel footage in film, which is a different kind of artifact. Uh, digital artifacts are a certain kind of artifact. Film is a certain kind of artifact. And this is our way of trying to communicate what it, what it would have been like to have been standing there in 1948 when the, when the monument itself was unveiled and how the commemoration of the Holocaust developed from the immediate post-war years forward until the present day. And then we come at the very end to the renewal of Jewish life on a small scale and the enormous interest on the part of the Polish public in all things Jewish. And it's here that we present interviews with Jews living in Poland today, answering questions. And again, um, short of having living human beings, we're not gonna have a Jew in a box, as they had. And actually, that's a very interesting exhibition. And I wanna just add that at the Jewish Museum in Berlin, they took an exhibition from the Jewish Museum, the Jewish Museum in Hohenems, which was an exhibition loosely titled, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Jews and Were Afraid to Ask. And so uh, what the Jewish Museum in Berlin did was to refigure that exhibition and to add the podium with the Jew and the box. And apparently, uh, one of the journalists came one day on a Sunday, because I think it was like a two-hour Sunday event, came one day on a Sunday with a Holocaust survivor and was very curious how his friend, the Holocaust survivor, would react. To his surprise, the survivor walked up to the box and sat down with a young man in the box and took questions, which I think is really extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. So we don't, we're not going to have a Jew in the box, and, but the ways in which Jews living in Poland today think about Poland, Jewish life in Poland, the Jewish future in Poland, and who they are is very important and very intangible. And so we asked a set of questions, one of which I would never have thought to ask here, for example, or anywhere in North America or Israel, and it's the question, did you always know you were Jewish? And the answers are across the spectrum, and we have about 20 different people responding to, to these questions. And what I want to do is to end with uh, our Polish Wooden Synagogues. We have currently, right now, a marvelous exhibition of Frank Stella's Polish Village series, and it's a great story. And the story is that Frank Stella, in 1970, and I think he was sick in the hospital. I, there are various versions of the story. But Richard Meyer, who was a very, uh, the architect, Richard Meyer, as you know, Richard Meyer is the architect for the Getty Center um, and the Getty Museum. Richard Meyer gave uh, Frank Stella a copy of the Wooden Synagogue book by uh, Maria and Kazimierz Piechotka. Uh, and this was a book that was published under communism in 1957 in Polish. And for reasons I can't understand, nobody understands, in English in 1959. And Richard Meyer gave this book to Stella, and Stella was absolutely intrigued by it. And what Stella did was to create a series of uh, paintings. Well, actually, he called them, he, he said he wasn't painting paintings, he was building a painting. And these, this is a turning point in his work of the, the sort of constructed paintings 
and he did them as a series with the uh, with, with drawings, um, maquettes, the finished work, and it, various iterations of it. And for each of these, each of the little series, he named it for the town that had in it the wooden synagogue that was the inspiration for the work itself. And this is this is really um, a very very extraordinary series. The idea that these wooden synagogues would inspire one of the most important American abstract artists to create a series of works that would actually be pivotal in terms of his own artistic development. So we opened this exhibition in, uh, on February 18th, if I recall, and Stella, who's a marvelously warm and generous and kind person, he came, he came with his wife and he came with his studio, and I had the opportunity um, to interview him and also to take him through the exhibition. And of course, I could hardly wait to show him our wooden synagogue. So first of all, you know, we had a look at the upper level with the timber framing, and then we were at the lower level, and we came to the painted ceiling. And he said to me, it's of no interest. <laughs> In other words, and then I, you know, of course, I, I, I mean, I, I realized it, but I thought, I thought to myself, but I said, I said to him, but you've never seen what it looks like inside. You've never seen it painted. You've never seen it in color. You're of no interest. Why? Because it was the timber framing that was interesting to him. It was the joinery. It was the construction. It was the architecture. That was of interest to him. So uh, I was a bit taken aback, but I, <laughs> I recovered. And, um, and so uh, my, 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 my parting words are that you are cordially invited to come to Poland and to visit Pauline Museum and to visit our marvelous exhibition and our fabulous Kwoziec Synagogue. And I thank you very, very much. Uh, yeah. Did we show the cantor performing? No, because I, um, I think that it, the whole thing wasn't recorded as such. Uh, it was part, no, the, the, the presidents were walking through, he performed, but no, unfortunately. But I, I would, you know, maybe they'll come another chance. Maybe they'll come another chance. I would love, love to have him do a concert from the Bima. He's on YouTube. He's, yes, he is. Uh, Lemmer's on YouTube, and he's a wonderful person. He's a marvelous person. Uh, the demographics of who visits the museum. Um, I would say that in the winter, it's about 70% Polish, 30% international, about half Jewish, half not. In the high season, the estimates can be even 50, 60% Polish, 40, 50% international, again, about half and half. Yes, yes, we actually are very serious about doing visitor, visitor studies and visitor surveys, and so uh, we have a variety of ways of trying to understand our visitors. We have instant feedback, we have two cards, one says, I came to the, I came to the museum because, and the second says, what I most remember about the exhibition is, and we've collected maybe six, seven thousand of those so far, um, we have a, um, a visitor survey uh, that people fill out, and we, we do in-depth interviews, but there's also a sociology department at the University of Warsaw that does very serious uh, research on uh, visitors and also potential visitors, people who haven't visited. But that's definitely very, very important. I should also say that any museum is a, an educational and cultural center, which means that our educational program is extremely important. There's a whole floor of the museum that is dedicated specifically to the education center, and they're very innovative and huge outreach. So it's actually the most active and largest department uh, in the exhibition. I would say the two big, big, big elements are education and the core exhibition. Okay, so uh, there, there are about two, there are at least two questions there. One has to do with how Jews experience the towns their families came from, and the other has to do with Poles in these towns coming to the museum. 
So, uh, first of all, there are lots and lots of groups coming, and they're coming from all over the country. But we also have a program called Museum on Wheels, where we go to those towns. And the Museum on Wheels goes to towns of a population of less than 50,000 from across the entire country. And they do so, the towns have to apply and have to prepare for the visit and have to collaborate with the museum. And the intention of those visits, our Museum on Wheels is like a big container that opens up, is to work with the town to recover the Jewish past of the town and to work uh, with not only with school groups but also with the communities that are with the with the town itself that's that's living there that's the first thing the second is that um, there's a wonderful film that I would recommend there's several films uh, but one in particular called a town called Brushtek and it is a film uh, that was uh, it's really about Jonathan Weber a very interesting person, uh, a professor from the UK living today in Krakow, who decided to go back to his grandfather's town, because he himself was born in the UK and so were his parents, to go back to his grandfather's town and to restore the cemetery. And what's extraordinary about the film is the way in which he got to know and engaged and worked with the local community and their response and their investment. When they finally opened the restored cemetery, he had chairs for 50 people. He figured 50 people would come. The entire town came. Hundreds of people came. And I can only speak from my own experience. My, my father was born, my parents were born and raised in Poland, my mother in brest my father in Apatov, a town between Krakow and, and Warsaw, a little closer to Krakow than Warsaw. And, um, the, my father, on his first visit in 1988, was very nervous, and there was nobody around. It was a hot summer day, and he, 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 couldn't, he couldn't leave fast enough. And then when we returned in 1995, he got to know uh, one young man in the town who took a great interest. And over the years, what developed was um, an interest in my father coming to the town and showing his paintings there, which we did in the county seat. And the way in which the town received him is just exceptional. And uh, Swab Greenberg made a very beautiful film called Paint What You Remember, which is about my father going back to his hometown and how he was received. So I think that there are many different experiences, but uh, much has to do with the way in which those of us whose families come from these places, when we go to these places, how we engage with those who are there and not only and particularly uh, the effort that we make in a sense to, how can I say, to prepare and establish some kind of relationship with those who are living there now. And of course, the experiences vary. vary. Some of them are awful, but some of them are really wonderful and very, very inspiring. So thank you, Barbara.